Hi, I'm John Larson. Today is Flag Day, uh, June the 14th, and earlier this morning, in fact, um, we had the great opportunity to uh, gather with uh, Vietnam veterans from across the state, but primarily from the 1st Congressional District, to talk about and uh, recognize and commemorate uh, 50 years ago the uh, service that so many provided uh, for their country. I'm interviewing today one of those gentlemen who answered the call of his nation and left from Hartford, Connecticut, where he was a graduate of Weaver High School, to uh, serve his country in Vietnam. And uh, we're delighted to be able to do this both in conjunction with uh, Central Connecticut State University and the Library of Congress, who archives uh, veterans' histories, which this will become a permanent part of and help not only current but future generations uh, understand both the sacrifice and, uh, in people's own words, what that experience was like. So, for the record, could you state your full name, Steve? I'm Steve Moreland Harris. What's the Moreland? Where does that come from? Is That's that my a, mother's maiden name. Mother's maiden name. I thought that might be the case. And, uh, in which uh, war did you serve in? Vietnam. And what was the branch of service? Army. So you served in Vietnam and with the Army. And what was your rank? Uh, when, I was, when I left now, I was a sergeant. I went there as a PFC, left a sergeant. Now what does PFC mean? Private first class. Private kind first of like class. Low on the totem pole. Lowest man on the total board. Not quite lowest, but pretty much <laughs> close to the bottom. And you left as a sergeant. Left as a sergeant. So how was, how was that path forward achieved? Well, a lot has to do with attrition. Uh, you know, you don't have to be in, you didn't have to be in Vietnam a long time to get ranked. If the fellas that were ranking above you in front of you got wounded or, or killed, you, you just moved up. And in my case, that, that primarily was the case. Uh, my squad leader, one squad leader was wounded, the next guy moved up, got killed, and next thing you know, I was leading the, the squad. And what part of Vietnam were you located in? I was in, in the Central Highlands. I, was, I started out in Pleiku, I arrived in Vietnam in 67, I uh, was assigned to the 4th Infantry Division, and our area of operation was um, up in the Central Highlands. Our base camp was in Pleiku, so I wound up in Pleiku. In 67, uh, January of 67, 68, the beginning of Tet, which was supposed to be a very peaceful holiday for the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese decided to, 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 to wage a coordinated strike all along South Vietnam. So at, it, it's probably late at night, probably around midnight, we wound up being helicoptered from Pleiku up into the mountains of Dok To. And that, that was the beginning of the, the Tet Offensive, and that was horrific, to say wow. the least. So let me, let me ask you, just backing up a little bit, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. You enlisted? Yeah. Where were you living at the time? Right here in North Hartford. Right here in North Hartford. Do you recall the date? I enlisted in, I left in September, I think it was September 7th, 1966. I shipped out to Fort Jackson for basic training. Uh, they thought I had a little uh, something going for myself, and they decided I was going to be an electrician tech. Well, it started out, I enlisted to be a military police officer. Oh. Yeah. And <laughs> I got through uh, like eight weeks of, ten weeks of training, and I got called to uh, military personnel department and said, you know, we, we've got a little problem. And I said, well, what's the problem? So you don't have a driver's license. I said, right. I said, well, you can't be a military police officer. You don't have a driver's license. I said, they didn't tell me that when I enlisted to be a military policeman. So they said, well, what we're going to do, what we can do, is because you enlisted, we have a contract with you. Obviously, the contract is about to be breached because we can't give you what you want. So we can, you know, discharge you. To be very honest with you, we discharge you, 
in the next call up in the next draft we'll probably just turn around and draft you so I said you know what I'll stay what else is there that you have to offer and <laughs> I wound up they wound up sending me to x-ray technician school hmm in San Antonio Fort Sam Houston San Antonio and I was fine until it was time to self-inject and I you know I just I've always had this kind of fear of needles so I get down and I can't self-inject myself. And then when I found out there was like 150 bones in the hand and you had to know each medical term for the bone, I said, I'm not going to last here. <laughs> and I didn't. And I wound up, they sent me back to Fort Jackson, and this time I was in infantry. Needless to say, I didn't flunk out of infantry. So that's how I wound up in the infantry. So you wound up in the infantry, but it's interesting to, uh, to me. Uh, why did you choose the Army? My uncle was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne. Oh, wow. And I remember he would come home on leave, and you know, when you're a paratrooper, you blouse your boots, your boots are down in those jump boots, and those yeah. jump boots. And as a young man, as a kid, I would see that, and I was just so intrigued by that. And it just, my uncle was my hero. So, so the cut of the jib, the uniform itself yeah. was yeah. Uh, appealing to yeah. you, and uh, yeah. you decided that, uh, and, and why the Army? Because your uncle was in the Army? Yeah, and he was in the 82nd Airborne. I thought I wanted to be a paratrooper. Oh. And uh, until drill, drill sergeant said to me, there's only two things that fall out of the sky. Uh, Were there any instructors that stick out in your mind or that you remember? And how sergeant, did you get through that initial Drill program? Sergeant Mumford. Drill Sergeant Mumford. Drill Sergeant Mumford was about five feet five, weighed about 75 pounds, and was the meanest man I ever met. <laughs> and the guy, I, I, you know, listen, I'm not Lou Alcinda, but I look like Lou Alcinda when we stood kind of toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And he'd look up, he was always looking up, and he'd be yelling in your face, and he'd be spitting in your face and yelling, but you was too scared to move. And that guy, i tell you, he, he, he was a good, good, good drill sergeant. Um, some of the lessons he taught, me and basic helped me survive in Nam, and that's what the drill sergeant is supposed to do, teach you things that help you survive in adverse conditions. So, Sergeant Mumford, wherever you may be, all five, seven of you. What was the most important lesson, you think, that he taught you? Stay right. cool under fire. He said, you're going to be scared, but stay cool. Stay cool. He says, panic kills. Yeah. Did you see that in Vietnam? A lot of it. A lot of it. But you got to remember, most of us in Vietnam were 18, 19. Yeah. You were 20, 21. You were considered an old man. <laughs> Seriously. If you no, were, I hear you. you were, if you were 21, you were considered an old man. So yeah. where was your boot camp? Fort Jackson, down in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Mm. And after boot camp, where did you go? Well, I, for a short period, I went to Texas. <laughs> I came back after, you know, kind of flunking out of the medical thing. Yeah. And they sent me back to Fort Jackson, the infantry, which I failed with, as I said, with flying colors. Mm. Most folks pass with flying colors if you wound up in the infantry. Yeah. And so once you were designated in the infantry, when did you end up going to Vietnam? Was it a short time thereafter? Once I graduated from advanced infantry training, right. they sent me home for... Two weeks. Now, what's the difference between advanced infantry training and infantry training? Well, really no difference, but that's what it's called, advanced infantry training. And uh, like I said, once I finished that, they sent me home for two weeks. Well, I'm telling you. I leave, and next thing you knew, I was on a plane headed to Oakland, California. So you came home. Mm -hmm. Tell me about coming home, because I've heard this from a lot of veterans you just been through basic training, you get out of boot camp, you had this experience with Sergeant Mumford, now you come home and there's only a short window of time before you're headed to a far off place called Vietnam. Yeah. Did you know that's where you were headed? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you know, God, I've had an interesting journey. Again, I enlisted. Uh, wanted to be a military police officer. That didn't work. I flunked out of, uh, of uh, Fort medical. Sam Houston Medical. Wound up in the infantry. I got my first set of orders once I graduated from AIT. I was supposed to go to uh, Korea. I'm like, okay, you know, Korea, not a bad assignment. That lasted 24 hours, I think. Those orders got rescinded. Then I was going to Germany. I don't even think that lasted 24 hours. 
And then the first sergeant called me and he says, you got some new set of orders. I don't think they're going to get rescinded. He says, you're going across the pond. And we all knew what across the pond meant. I mean, you're going to now. So I went from Korea to Germany to Vietnam in about a three-day period. Went home on leave, two weeks, came back, kissed my, fam my family goodbye, jumped on a train, went down to New Haven, jumped on a plane. So tell me a little bit about what it was like, you know, when you got back home. You've been gone, you come back home. What did you say to the family? It was tough because it was me and my mom, mostly. And um, the one thing my mother wanted more, most for me was to go to school. But once I got out of Weaver, I was tired of school. You know, I was like, ah, I'm not doing school anymore. And when I enlisted, she didn't know I had enlisted. And once, when I did it, I knew it was going to be really difficult for me to tell her and even more difficult for her to accept that. And, uh, you know, it was one Friday afternoon. She would gotten off of work, was sitting at the kitchen table, and I'm like, I got to tell her. And I just said, my, you know, I just, I've enlisted in the, in the uh, Army, me and Dennis and George and some of the friends that enlisted with me. And uh, I remember my mother cried. And, you know, that, that, that was hard. Because that broke my mother's heart. Oh, I God. was the only son. Yeah. And, you know, she, she knew about war. You know, and this Vietnam thing, man, was, every day it was on the news. Every day. Every day, and, casualty. Yeah, yeah. And that was the thing that she would focus on. And it was just, and I guess... Just kept saying, I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Don't worry. But, I mean, that broke her heart. Hmm. And what about your future wife? <laughs> uh, she, I mean, listen, hey, I did it. I did it. She, she wasn't happy about it. But, you know, she's planning a wedding. And I'm, I'm off to this, this faraway country. And I remember when I came home, uh, one of the things that her mother said to me, was you don't know how difficult that was trying to plan a wedding and then not sure if you were coming back home. I bet. Yeah, so. But it worked out. I'm here. You know, we've been married now 51 years, so. But that had to be a difficult decision nonetheless at the time. I mean, how do you, you know, you put yourself in your wife's shoes, you know, and then uh, you look at how many people didn't come back. I know. think. You know, when you're young, when you're 19 and 20, you're invincible. You're invincible, really. And and I kind of thought that I was invincible. Uh, I think we all thought we were invincible until we got there, and then the realization sets in, and it's it's just that's when you realize that this is going to be tough. So now, how did you get to Vietnam by a plane or boat? yeah, we uh went by plane. Like I said, I flew into uh, Oakland, California, and you have to process into Vietnam. And, uh, I what does in, that mean when you say you have to process? Into you have to process. You, you go in, they do a bunch of paperwork, they start assignments of where you're going to go, what, right. what corps you're going to be in, those kinds of things. But the thing that, that, that stuck with me about being in Oakland was one thing about the military is there's no downtime. There's no downtime. Whether you're permanent or temporary personnel, there's no downtime. And like I said, when we flew in there, we knew we were going to be there for three days. So for three days, while we were processing, they were detailing us to do things around the Oakland base. And uh, it was this warehouse that was Warehouse 13. And I can remember being in basic and folks kept saying, look, you don't want to wind up in Warehouse 13. You know, what in the <laughs> world is Warehouse 13? Well, I think the second day I was there, I was picked to be on a detail to Warehouse 13. Warehouse 13 at the Oakland base was the temporary moor for returning KIEs from Vietnam. Oh, wow. And that's where funeral homes came in to pick up those bodies to ship to wherever they were going with their military escort. And, you know, when you talk about the realization hitting home, when I went to Warehouse 13, the, you know, the person would come in, they'd give us the, 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 the lot number or the body number name. We give it to the mortuary guy, he take us down, and he said, okay, that's it. We grab the casket, bring it back, and load it into the hearse to go wherever. And it dawned on me then that, you know, these are guys that went who are now coming home like this. And that was Warehouse 13. Warehouse 13. 
and this is in 1968 or 69? This is in, actually this is 1967. 1967, summer of 1967. Yeah, it was. Yeah, no, spring. Spring of 1967, yeah, because I left in May, so it was the spring of 1967. And now uh, you had just gotten out of, you graduated uh, AIT, right. Advanced Infantry Training. And you got out of high school in 66. The spring of 66, or June of 66. 66, yeah. So I went from, as I like to say to folks, I went from chasing my wife at Weaver High School and Weaver Night, in one year, I was chasing the 66 NVA Rocket Regiment in the Central Highlands of Vietnam. Wow. That's quite a different quite a sense jump. of chasing. Quite a jump. <laughs> quite a jump. So uh, you take you 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 fly in. Mm -hmm. You know you're processed out of Oakland, and then where do you fly to? Fly in to Cameron Bay, which is kind of like a shoreline. It's beautiful. Vietnam is a beautiful country from the air. And uh, Cameron Bay is down, like its name, it's a bay, it's beautiful. And we land, and I'll never forget it, here we are all, most of us are just, like I said, 19, 18, 19, 20 year old guys, mostly fresh out of high school, never really been anywhere. And here we land in this, this, this tropical place. And what I remember most about landing, two things. Number one, I looked out the window and I see these mama signs, Vietnamese women with straw brooms sweeping the runway, which was odd to me. Hmm. And I'm like, Jesus, Christmas, man, they gotta have a better system than this, you know? Just sweeping the runway, these little brooms. Then they turned the airplane off. And then <laughs> it seemed like in 60 seconds, we went from an air-conditioned airplane to about a 110-degree hot box. And when they opened those doors and we walked off that plane, I said, we are no longer in Kansas. Mm. It was, when that heat hit me in the face, it was like, oh my goodness, I'm not going to do this. I don't mind going to do this. So you land in Cameron Bay, mm -hmm. you get off the plane, and you're immediately introduced to the climatic change, and it's hot. What was a typical day like for you? At that point. Well, again, you know, we're processing in. Yeah. A couple of days, that takes a couple of days, you know, they're issuing us gear, issuing us weapons, ammunition, grenades, the whole ball of wax, uh, checking our shot cards, making sure we got all the necessary, you know, shots. Uh, again, we're having these classes on uh, malaria prevention, et cetera, et cetera. You got to take 10,000 different pills there mm -hmm. every day. And again, like I said, I was just, I was, and you know, you get, I know I'm in a, in a war zone now, but I don't really hear war, you know, because Cameron Bay is kind of sheltered, it's, yep. you know, so you don't hear the sounds of war. That lasted a couple of days. They took us out one night on a, they call it like a familiarization, welcome to the country kind of thing, and mm. took us up on a hill, we set up a perimeter. Set up a perimeter, none of us had ammunition except the, the guys that took us up there. Uh, and again, like I said, it was like, it was almost surreal. I said, nah, this ain't too bad. I can do this. Well, third day, it was like, okay, you've been assigned to the 4th Infantry Division. You're going to the 2nd Brigade, 1st Battalion, 8th Infantry. Get on that chopper. Actually, I got on a caribou. What's yeah. a caribou? It's like a little small cargo plane. It makes a mm. ton of noise, and it rattles. The thing feels like it's going to come apart. <laughs> and uh, we flew from Cameron Bay to Play Coup. Uh, we landed. Now things started to happen very quickly. Okay, you're going to be with Company B. Report to Company B headquarters. It's over there. I went over there. I'm Steve, you know, Private Steve Harris, RE 11799 or 49 or 8. You know, okay, look it up, all right. You're going to, oh, where did I go? A company, right? Report in, he said, okay. Who did Take you report in. to? Who was your uh, I reported sergeant? to. I reported to the company first sergeant. Officers really didn't do much in right. Vietnam. It was the, the, the senior non-commissioned officers that were kind of like the, the bulldogs of the, of the uh, companies and platoons. And squads. Remember the sergeant's name? Did I report it to him in Vietnam? No. no. 
because he, he was just kind of like a supply guy. Right, so he wasn't right. the, same, no, he wasn't the no, no. same kind of guy that Sergeant no. Mumford was. No, 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 no. But how anyway. Many different, how many different uh, sergeants did you have while you were there? Platoon sergeants? Yeah. I think two. As I said, you know, I went to two, three squad leads. That's how I wound up becoming a, I think I was a sergeant in like seven months. Wow. Because the attrition. The attrition. Wow. The attrition. When was the first time you saw a combat? I was in country about two weeks. And I remember asking guys, I mean, what what do I do when this hits the fan? They said, you'll know what to do. Your training will kick in. You'll find yourself in a firing position. You turn in fire. And that's exactly what happened. Hmm. That's exactly what happened. And again, you know, you're 19... 20. I mean, this is, this is, this ain't like being back home, you know, this is, this is serious business. And it's, one of the things I remember most about war, and I say this a lot, is I've seen man at his worst. I've seen man at his worst. And, you know, when you hear veterans say, you know, I don't, I don't like talking about it, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't understand the things that I've done or the things that I've seen. Were there casualties in your unit? Oh yeah, big casualties. Big. We were straight. We were a straight infantry unit. A lot of like people talk about the first air cab. Them guys flew around on helicopters everywhere. We marched everywhere. We carried heavy rucksacks. You'll see it in some of the pictures. We our, our stuff was in our rucksacks. And like I said, when we went up into Doctor, we were in the mountains. So it was constantly climbing up a mountain. You fight up a mountain. You get up there. You take. Take the top, you hang around maybe a day, and you go down the mountain to the next objective. So it was, it was just constant. It was constant. And like I said, after the first Tet Offensive, when uh, the North made the decision that they were going to, you know, invade the South, it was, it was, it was tough. It was tough. A lot of combat. Wow. Um, were you awarded any medals or citations uh, well, for that experience, or? Uh, I received the, the you know, uh, Army Accommodation Medal, uh, but no, nah, no silver stars, brown stars, things like that. You know. Did you sustain any injuries? Well, I, <laughs> three. I was in country about three months, and I came down with malaria. Almost killed me. Wow. Almost killed me. Uh, and I wound up in a you know field hot back. Actually, I wound back up at Cameron Bay. Um, and I think I was there for, for about a month. And I mean, that malaria almost killed me. And I, I remember that the therapy, we had to go out on the beach. And I'm not a beach guy, you know, right. all that sand and sun is, you know. But we had to go out there. They want us to go in the water and kind of walk up and down the shoreline to kind of build our strength up. And I remember being on the beach one day and I just sitting there, just, not just sitting there. And I heard somebody saying, are you Specialist Harris? Are you Specialist Harris? And I'm like, I don't know anybody be looking for me out here. <laughs> you know? He said, must not be looking for me. The guy finally came up to me. He said, are you Specialist Harris? I said, I'm, I'm Harris. I'm a specialist. So you RA 1179949? I said, yes, I am. He said, come with me. He said, when's the last time you rode home? I said, the last time I rode home? I said, it's been a while because I had gotten, you know, sick and he said come with me and he took me to a Mars station he said call home and a Mars station was basically this short radio wave shack where you went in and you tried to make a connection uh, with an operator in this case I think I made a connection with an Australian operator who transferred me wow. to a you know and it was you know because what had happened was my mother <laughs> had a dream that's something that happened to me. Right. And I hadn't written in a while. And she woke up and she called the Red Cross. And she said, Something happened to my some something has happened to my son. And they get, you know, they asked her, they said, Well, as an army, she said, No, I'm telling you something's happened to my son. Hmm. So, you know, I'm writing a home, so she has my unit number and all of that, because I can put that on the and she called the Red Cross. The Red Cross contacted the whoever. And they kind of tracked me, me down to my unit. And I guess they told me that I had gotten, you know, 
sick with malaria, and I was <clears throat> at Cameron being in the field hospital. And when, I never forget when I got home, I said, Ma, how did you know I was sick? Because I, I wouldn't write home about things that I knew that would upset her. And she said, you came to me in a dream, and you said, help me, Ma. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, obviously, you weren't in touch with your family, but after that, did you stay in touch with them pretty frequently? It's hard. How did you do Again, it? Again, you, you're in the infantry. We're in a straight leg unit. It's not like I said, it's not like we're in the first cab. We're in helicopters. We go out on a mission. We do whatever we're going to do that day and then fly, fly back. back. No. We were out, and while we were out at night, we didn't dig foxholes because we fought in North Vietnamese Army records. We, we built squad sized bunkers. This is the beginning of a bunker. We did this every single night. Wow. Every single night. And, we, and those bunkers were built so that we could stand up in them and fight. And this was every single How long night. did it take to build a bunker? Most of the day? Yeah, because usually we, we didn't stop pumping until about 4 in the afternoon. Stop pumping, then we'd have to look for them, but there was plenty of trees around. We'd have to look for trees to chop down to make, you know, uh, like beams overhead that we'd have to fill like 200 sandbags, but on top of those, this was every single night. So it wasn't a whole lot of time for writing. Wasn't a whole lot of time for writing. Yeah, so it's not like, you know, okay, guys, it's time for tea. Why don't you guys come That's over it. here? We hand out the pens and uh, right. no. we start writing. There's no time to write. No. Once wow. you dug those holes, it got dark. You better be in those holes. You better have those claymores out, those trip wires out. So what did you say to your mother, though, in terms of... I uh, never told my mother anything bad. Never. Yeah. She'd ask, you know, when I write it, she'd say, I'm well, see you soon. You know, never said anything. Wouldn't tell her I had jungle rot. Didn't tell I have, you know, I never told I had malaria. Wow. And, uh, and, and how long were you over there? Vietnam, yeah. a year. A year. Yeah. To the date, or? Yeah. That's how wow. you rotated. You had, to, you had to do a year. And once you got out after your year of service, mm -hmm. was it automatic that you went back home, or could you be called back again? Well, you could get called back again. But once you got out, you usually went home for 30 days. And, you know, and I, and I like to remind people that Vietnam was not like Korea or the Second World War where troops came home from Europe on boats, ships. So you had, you know, like a 30, 40 day period to kind of adjust to the fact that you were going back to the world. In Vietnam, we got on a Trans-American airline. Actually, I went over on the CIA 707. But anyway, you, you went on a jet. So you were back home in less than 24 hours. So you've gone from, in my particular instance, you've gone from, you know, contact with a hostile uh, adversary to home. You're back in wow. the States. And let me tell you, it, it is good, as glad as we were to get home, it takes, it's an adjustment. It's, a, there was no, it wasn't like, like I said, when the troops came home from World War II in Korea that, you know, they had, you know, Time to therapists assume. and things like that on the ship, talking to guys. Look, okay, now you're going home now. So, I mean, yeah. when you hear a sudden noise, it's not, you know, the NVA coming over the wire. It's just, you know, just you're going home. We didn't have that. Was there anyone to help you guys deal with uh, post-traumatic stress or deal with... Uh, you had to... How do you think most people did deal with that? They didn't. They dealt with it in silence. In silence. I mean, even today, we'll be averaging about 23, 24 suicides a day. That's, that's guys that, that are having issues trying to adjust. In Vietnam, we had nobody. Nobody. Did you ever get a break while you are in Vietnam? Did they have times that you go to... Maybe? They would bring us in. We'd be out maybe a month, month and a half. They'd bring us into a forward fire base for maybe five days, enough to resupply, you know, get get, get new recruits, because yeah. invariably people get wounded, wounded or killed. killed. Uh, and you couldn't relax because once you came back, what they would do is they would put us to work in the base camp, perimeter duty. I remember we, they wouldn't let us eat in the mess halls because we were filthy. You know, we had been out in the, in the boonies, you know, if you were in the rear, you were living a good life. You know, you were eating hot food every day. We was eating sea rations. You mm. know, uh, what was that like? 
it was eating sea rations. You, yeah. get, you can get used to anything, particularly when you're hungry. Beans and Frank started looking like gourmet meals after a while. <laughs> um, peaches and pound cake. I remember, man, you could sell those out there. Peaches and pound cake. And a sea ration, though, what would be in that? I mean, it was gross. Let me tell you. It was, just think, I mean, it's a can. Oh, about. Jesus, this is somebody's coffee here. Oh. Yours. No, I don't drink coffee. About this, about this tall. And I mean, like I said, it could be beans and franks in that, in that, uh, spaghetti and meatballs in a can now. In a can. Um, what else was there? Wasn't even Chef Boyardee, huh? It was a mess, let me tell you. <laughs> no but spam, you know, no. Uh... Well, you had, what was it? You had ham, but it was, it, it, it was just, let me, I'll put it this way. If we had had a choice, we would have probably asked for something a little different, but we didn't have a choice that you eat what you had. So when you got back, when they brought you back to the base, right? Did you did they at least give you a good meal? Yeah, um, but we had to eat last. Uh, they didn't want us in their mess tents. I remember one time we came back, and the mess out they kicked us out of the, the mess hall, kicked us out. You know, you guys can't come in and go out. So we said okay, we went out. We had some CS gas grenades. We just rolled a few of those up under the the tent, and we kept moving. We can't eat here. Ain't nobody eating here. Don't you get CS gas in an area? No, and that, they they threw us out of the basement. They, go, get them out of here. These guys. When you're, are crazy. In, when you're in a combat area and you've been mm -hmm. out like this, etc., are there times or are there any particular humorous situation? I mean, how did you break the tension? How do you? How did the guys all bond together as a group? And uh, we used to have uh, little tape recorders, and everybody had a little small tape recorder. And you get tapes from home, you know, guys' wives are sending them tapes from home, with the, you know, or they send them music. And I remember we used to have, what do we call it? Um, oh, we would sit around and talk about our hometown. Like, oh. Okay, man, Tramp, if you come uh, visit me, this is what we're going to do. And we would just explain what, what a typical weekend night out in your town would be. And those were the kinds of things that, that and we were young again, like I said, so. Those were the kinds of things that kind of gave us a respite. But you didn't get many of those, because again, like I said, that night, night in Vietnam is, was dangerous. Very dangerous. And you know, you need all eyes and all ears. And the, 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 a cardinal sin was falling asleep on watch. You fall asleep on watch, man. Whew. What did you think of... Uh the officers that were above you at the time and, the, the, and your buddies that you served with? One of the things I remember were we had a lot of ROTC officers. Mm -hmm. They weren't bad guys, but they were new guys. Good officers listened to seasoned NCOs. You know, you were, you were you know, a buck second lieutenant, or even a first lieutenant, even captains. You, you depended a lot on your, your, your senior NCOs, guys that had been there, guys that had, you know, gone through this. And many of our NCOs were like, had done a couple of tours, you know, and they were seasoned. So, you know, I mean, I can remember we had a lieutenant once, young guy, very, you know, enthusiastic. And, and again, we're infantry. We never walk on trails, never walk on trails. And this guy wanted to go down a trail. He said, sir, we don't do trails. Now, if we want to go off into the, the bush, mm. well, you know, we can, we can follow the trail, but we're not going to walk down the trail. Well, why? It's quicker because, obviously, you know, if you've got a trail, there's, there's a bigger mines. risk of booby traps, yeah. mines, punji traps, the whole ball of wax. And Vietnam was, was unique in the sense that, I mean, when you talk about booby traps, I mean, they had booby traps where they take, <clears throat> so there were a lot of tunnels. We had guys that we called tunnel rats. You had to go out and clear, clear. I mean, we had hospitals, NBA hospitals, underground. Hmm. You had to go into a tunnel to kind of get to that level. And again, you know, the NBA were very crafty. They used what they had at hand. One of the most deadly snakes in Vietnam is a bamboo viper. We call them a two-step. You get hmm. bit, you get two steps, you fall over dead. They would tie the tail of a bamboo viper suspended from a string, put it in the entrance of a tunnel, and if you just kind of dove in there, 
You get bit by that bamboo vine. Now, no one's fired a bullet. They just used a snake. Pungy pits. You know, they, they were great with pungy pits. And you'd be walking along, the next thing you know, whoosh. And you, you've been impaled by 15, 20 pungy steaks that have been dipped in, in buffalo dung. Mm. You know, so, I mean, infection sets in right away and boom. You know, now you've lost the leg. And their, their theory was if you can take and injure one person, it's going to take two GIs to move that person. You literally put three people out of commission. Out of commission. So, again, you know, our officers, the new ones, it was an education. And, you know, once we explained to them why, they were pretty. But if you were insistent that you were going to do something, we would say that you leave. Did you ever, did you keep any kind of journal or was that, it was just not nah, enough time to write? Or? Nah, nah, no, no journal. But you seem to have a pretty good, vivid rec recollection of you this. You never forget things like that. I was just going to say. You don't forget things like that. You I just can't don't. even imagine. You just don't. This is my journal. Each one of these pictures tells a story, except the one that you was looking at. So now, as you were going through all of this, mm -hmm. and you were there for a year, mm -hmm. The closer you got to the end, what was your thought process? You get what we call short timers fear. What's it called? Short timers fear. You know, most of us had some kind of calendar. Some guys wrote them on their helmets. When you talk about a journal, that was the only journal you might have. It was a paper that showed the number of days you had left in country. Yeah. And when you got within a 30-day period, now you became what was called a short timer. And now you, you become overly cautious because you survived. Yeah. 11 months, you're down to like your last 30 days. Wow. God knows you don't want anything to happen to you now. And usually once you got to that point, you know, the, 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 the company first sergeant knew, and they would do things like, okay, you know, turn your squad over to somebody else. If you got that much time and you usually got a leadership role in the, in the platoon that you're in, he said, turn your squad to somebody else. You take, you become the RTO for the lieutenant. So now you're not going out on ambushes. You know, you're not walking point, anything like that. They try to, because you've gotten so close to going home, they try and put you in a position that, you know, you can you get there. Yeah, yeah. So was that what they did in your case? No. <laughs> so you were still going out on point? Yeah, well, not point, because I'm a sergeant now. Yeah. And I wasn't walking point. I was sending guys to walk on point. I didn't go on ambushes anymore. Right. Uh, you know, I'd have to pick guys to go on ambush, which is, in itself, you know, weighs on you because when you pick somebody to go out and you're going to send this guy out a click and a half, two clicks out in front of this, this, this perimeter, they're out, there's three guys out there by themselves. Wow. So uh, did you then, as a sergeant, did you, to be processed out, did you go back to Cameron Bay? No. Uh, yes. But first I went back to the forward base camp, turning on my ammunition again. Yeah. Actually, I got out the day that they took me out of the field. I think I had five days left in country. We had a, actually we had just come off an assault and we were digging in. The first sergeant came down to my hole. He said, Sergeant Harris, he said, there's a chopper coming in pretty soon. Get on it. It's going to be the last chopper out for a while. He said, leave all your, your mags except one. Leave all your grenades. Just take one mag and your weapon. Get on that helicopter. That's how I found out. Then it really, you know, it, it, it's odd because when you spend, you know, months with, with, with guys, they become your family. Yeah. And, you know, they knew I was short, you know, but I just, I, I didn't expect it to be that sudden. And when it happened, it was just, it was, it was like when I left my mother, told my mother I was going in the, in the service. I, I just felt, almost felt like I was abandoning it. Yeah. And my wife will tell you, I think the first night on, it was tough because yeah. I had survivor's remorse. Yeah. You turn on the television from the time the news came on to the time it ended, it was about Vietnam. And it just kept showing these, these different areas in Nam. And every area they showed, man, it was infantry and artillery, battles raging. And I just, I remember crying. And I couldn't stop. Did you stay in touch with any of those guys? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first couple of years, matter of fact, some of us wound up stationed together. When I got back, I went to, they sent me to Fort Lewis in, uh, up in Washington State. And some of the guys that were in my platoon were stationed there. And we were close, you know, we would visit. Uh, but, you know, as time goes on, obviously, you know, you kind of grow apart. And, uh, you know, 
you stop calling, you stop writing. When did you uh, first get to come back to Hartford after all of that? I came back to Hartford. I, I left Vietnam May, I want to say it was May, May 8th and 9th. I came back home what, three weeks after Dr. King got assassinated. Oh, wow. Well, I came home. And I didn't know. I knew he had gotten assassinated because we had, we had went on a combat assault. We were digging one of these holes, getting mm -hmm. ready for the night. And a guy came running and jumped into my hole. And he said, Tramp, man, they killed Dr. King. I said, what are you talking about? Dr. King, Dr. King is dead. He was killed in Memphis. I said, and we all had, like I said, transistor radios. We had the armed service station. And I guess they had brought, I didn't hear it, but I guess they had brought, and it was true, that broadcast was armed service. But, you know, again, we had just, Vietnam is Vietnam. There was this kind of like, okay. We were shocked and a little, but, you know, again, we had to get through these, these the nights. Nice day yourself. Right. And I didn't really, and because we were, again, we were a straight infantry units, so we were constantly in the field. I didn't, it wasn't when I was hearing about riots here, riots there. I didn't know it was a riot in Hartford until I got home, until I got home. When, when my, my mother and grandmother picked me up at Bradley Airport, we were coming down 91, and we usually get off at the North Main exit, and as we approached the exit, you know, I'm sitting in the car, I'm just glad to be home, and I'm looking, I'm looking down the road, and I could see some, somebody, some men standing at the exit. I didn't pay, I figured maybe it's the highway department, so I don't know. And as we got closer, I noticed it was state police. Three state police officers with shotguns and gas masks. Then my mother turned around and said, we didn't want to tell you this, but the city has been burning ever since Dr. King got, got assassinated. And I remember looking to the right, because it used to be the old Fuller Brush building down there on Main yeah. Street. I remember looking to the right, and all I saw was smoke. Police. People running back and forth across Main Street. And I said to my mother, I just left this shit. Yeah, I just left this. I thought I was coming home to sanctuary. Hmm. We had to go all the way down. Got off at the State Street exit. Went up, took a right on the Main Street to come back north. And remember the old Firestone was oh, down yeah. there. We got to the old Firestone, and my God, it looked. There was just this wall, this 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 blockade they had built there. And you had the police on one side and riot gear and shotguns. You had people on the other side running back on Main Street, running back and forth across the street. Wow. And I think the only reason they let us through that, that, that barricade that day was I had my uniform on. Wow. I said, we're trying to get home. That's all. Trying to get home. Amazing. So you get home. Mm -hmm. And um, what did you do next? Did you start right away uh, with the fire department? No. Was it a time, or no. what did you do? I still had a year and a half left at the service. I had to go back. I you just had to go. Where did you? Where did they send you after that? Uh, Fort Lewis in Washington State. Sent me to drill sergeant school. I became a drill sergeant. So you must have had an offer to stay on, right? If you were. Drill, oh yeah. And you said no. no. I'm gonna. Actually, I was gonna stay. I said, you know what? I like this. I don't like war, obviously, but I, I like the fact that I'm a sergeant. I had talked to my first sergeant, because he had talked to me about realist, and I said, you know, I, I, I think I could do, do, do this. I think, you know, all in all, the military's a decent place. Until, um, and again, I went to drill sergeant school, so now I'm a, you know, a certified United States Army drill sergeant. I'm guaranteed 18 months under my campaign hat, which means that I can't be deployed anywhere for 18 months. I have to train troops for at least 18 months. And... You know, that got pretty good, you know. I'm like, geez, I'm going to get promoted. I'm going to get this little reenlistment bonus. You know, my first daughter, Kim, over there was born. And wow. life was kind of good. And I said, okay. Then I get a call from a friend of mine who works in uh, personnel. He said, just want to give you a heads up, Trent. What's going on? He says, your name's come back down on 11. They're going to send you back to 9 once your 18 months is over. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, okay. I went back to the first side. and said, on second thought, I think I'll get out. Yeah. Because I knew I couldn't do another year in the infantry in Vietnam and get out alive. Yeah. I said, nah, that's it. I'm going home. Well, now I'm home. That was a wise decision. I think so. I think so. So you go back home, mm -hmm. and then what does life hold for you there? Well, you're, you're back home, you're with your wife and your yeah, well, yeah. new baby. Yeah. And I went back to Pratt and Whitney. Yeah. Got on there, but I said, I can't do this. 
this this is just not me. You know, so I and I remember What did first, you do with Brad Winnie? I was an ODID grinder. I used to grind uh, little gears for jet engines. Yep. And one of the things that, that, that I remember was, that, again, I've just finished three years in the military, a year in combat. Everybody in my department, in that department, was missing fingers on their hands. Because at that time, you had to literally put your hands in the machine to put the part in and pull the part out. And, you know, when you do something long enough, you get kind of lax. You may be a fraction slower than normal. And that sharp blade would come back. Like I said, everybody in that department was missing fingers. Jesus. And my, my lead man was a guy, been that crap for a while. He said, son, you can do better than this. He said, because if you stay here, you're going to look just like this. And I said, okay, I'm out of here. And I, <laughs> when, I, when I decided to leave the military, the first time I said to me, I'm going to give you some, some advice. When you get back home, Take the test for the police department, fire department, and the post office. He says, you're, you're a returning serviceman. You'll get some points for that. You should be able to get a good job. So I said, okay, let me get out of shot. So I put in three applications, police, fire, and post office. I said, whoever calls me first, that's where I'm going. Thank God the fire department called me first. Mm. So I did 27 years there. And, well, you didn't just do 27 years. You rose to the rank of captain. Captain, yeah. Captain, yeah. What was that like? It was like being in the military again. And I think that's what I liked. I like structure. Yeah. I, I do. I like structure. And the thing I like about being a soldier and being a firefighter is it's about the crew. It's about the team. And the team is only as good as the men in it. And so we all kind of train together, eat together, sleep together, fight together. And, uh, again, that, that, that was the job for me. And one of the saddest moments I had once I came back from now was I was sitting in the kitchen of the firehouse watching, like most of us, watching the news. And, you know, we kept hearing about how the uh, North Vietnamese were closing in on Saigon. And I remember sitting there and watching the actual fall of Saigon. And first I was angry. Then I was sad. And I thought to myself, this is what we fought for. Hmm. This is what we fought for? To watch those helicopters land on that aircraft carrier, and there was no room, and they was pushing those Hueys off into the South China Sea. I just, I, it, it just, it hurt, because I thought about the guys that I lost over there. Hmm. You have to. You have to. 1920. How many guys did you lose? Five. Five. In my squad. Most of them from all, all over the country? Them, all of them. Young. Young. All had dreams and aspirations. Just wanted to go home. Mm -hmm. Still stays with you, too, doesn't it? Yeah. It took me three tries to get to the wall and did you belong to any veterans organizations when you got home? Did you sign up? Yeah, local VFW post, you know, American Legion post. But again, you know, <laughs> this is the other rub. Um, we're almost like, Vietnam vets are almost like the lost soldiers. Mm. You know, nobody really respected us. Even other veterans. Yeah. You guys didn't fight a war. Yeah. You guys lost the war. Mm. So, you know, you it was hard to find a place that you could go where people really understood you. Even in the veterans community. I'll bet. If there was a takeaway from the whole experience and you were advising someone today who says, you know, I think I'm I'm fresh out of Weaver and I'm I don't know whether I'm ready to go to college, there's not a specific trade I'm interested in, uh, I'm thinking about the military. 
What would you advise? You know, and, and I've thought about that a lot. I have four grandsons, you know, and even now with this thing about the, 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 the tankers burning in uh, Iraq. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, oh boy, this is how Vietnam got started, the Gulf of Tonkin, right? Here we go again. I And it, listen, I tell people that the military was good for me because it gave me discipline. It made me understand how working as a cohesive team to achieve an objective is a good thing. Uh, and it builds character, but it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. And, you know, it's, it's, and this is a new army. I don't even know if I can survive in, in this new army because I remember being a drill sergeant. Um, one day I was, went into the barracks and CO comes in, he says, Sergeant Harris post this on the back of the uh, bulletin board, bring the crews up, have them read it, ask them if they understand. And what it was, was it was a recruit's bill of rights. Hmm. <laughs> like, recruits ain't got no rights. <laughs> a crew is a crew, you know? And I said to myself then, I said, you know, this army's changing. This army's changing. And listen, I'm not saying to change for the worse. I mean, they probably did change for the better. But I do know this. When you're in combat and that, that squad leader or that, that platoon sergeant or that lieutenant says, okay, guys, let's go up and at them. People say, what's the best way to, to defeat an ambush? You charge it. It takes a lot of guts to stand up and run into an ambush. But if that's the only way you can get out or somebody can get out, that's what you have to do. And you don't have time to persuade people to do that. Yeah, you're not going to debate. No, the, there's uh, no debate. Whether or not this is a good thing to do or what the logic no, is. No, but I, it's a new, no, and again, like I said, so, you know, now we're into this volunteer, you know, army kind of thing. And I just feel, you know, I go to, a, even today, I mean, yesterday, Thursday, every Thursday night, I go to a veterans wellness group meeting. It's just me and one other Vietnam veteran and the rest of the guys are Iraq and Afghan vets, all mostly combat guys. And, you know, when you look around, I look around, and I say to myself, man, we all suffer from the same thing. You know? And I've been lucky. I, I, and I know I have been. I've been lucky. I've had the support of, of my family, which is big. Yeah. You know, which is, which is big. Um, because, I mean, there's times I have my moments. I'm, I'm, I'm hypervigilant, you know. And I know I am. I'm hypervigilant. I'm very... I try to be very aware of what's going on around me because I'm always waiting for something to happen. Mm. And that's part of my training. But, well, not only my training, but I think that's the condition that you come back with when you come back from combat. You know, you're just always waiting for something to happen because when things happen in combat, they happen at a split second. My wife will tell you, we go into places, I tell her the first thing you do is you, you find out, you look for the, and part of this has to do with the fire department too. I said, look for the exits. And always remember this, that if something happens, people have a tendency to go to the door that they came in. I said, that's going to be a problem. So we're going to go, you know, when everybody's running this way, we're going that way. Because there's exits down there as well. But people's natural instinct is to run for the door that they came into. And that's pre-planned, you know. Uh, and again, that's, that's from my, my time that I spent in the military and my 22 years 27 years in the fire department. Will you pre-plan? If you pre-plan, you know, you got to know what you're going to do before it happens. So when it happens, you can just do it. All valuable tools. So the, the discipline that you picked up, the structure that you were able to exist under, the real crucible that only the situation of war and combat can bring, uh, it's influenced your entire life. Principles to live by. And the one thing that I, I, I remember MacArthur when he spoke to the cadets, and I'm not even, I wasn't an officer, but I was just so, when he talked about duty on a country, yeah. veterans that stand strong, duty on a country. And no matter, and I tell people, no matter what, we're always veterans. We know how to do what we do. Anything else in this interview that you would like to add that I might not have asked you or that... Uh... Again, I just, you know, I, I don't think veterans' families get enough credit. Great point. And I think that, that, that we, need to, we, need to, we need to look at that and we need to talk about that because, 
you know, most of us, when we come home from war, we come home to our families. Mm. And nobody knows us better than our families. And, and I think that families, those first few years of a veteran coming home, those are, those, those are tougher families because the individual that they sent is basically not the same exactly. individual. That, they're the same, but they're not the same individual that they came back. And it's going to take that love and nurturing and that, that kind of patience because, again, when you see, I think it's 25 veterans a day committing suicide, you know, that's... Who was the first person you saw when you got back to Hartford? First person I saw? Jesus. There's a bunch of people waiting at my place when I got home. I remember that. Well, and your, and your uh, mother came to pick you up at the airport. Other than my grandmother, yeah. Yeah. And again, like I said, you know, when I saw them, I said, I'm home. Back in my sanctuary. Until I got down to the North Main Street exit, and I looked over and seen all that chaos and smoke and smell that tear gas. I said, "I just left this shit." It's an amazing story. Steve Harris. <laughs>